All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate the time. My name is Tom Bain, the Vice President of Marketing here at Morphosec. We are a very innovative cybersecurity company and a very different company. Looking forward to telling you a little bit more about that, but more importantly today, we have a guest presenter, Adrian Asher, who is the CISO of the London Stock Exchange Group. He's far more important than I am today. And, uh, you know, Adrian, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome, Tom. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Adrian, I've got some questions I've been, uh, I've been chomping at the bit to ask you. Um, so the way that we'll set this up today is I'll have, I have five, as we call them, burning questions to ask you. I've got some market data that we can either dispel or accept and acknowledge. And then I'd like you to give the, uh, the audience today a little bit of an idea and a perspective on sort of how you build your security strategy and what you're doing that's kind of different from the norm out there in the market today. Does that sound like an acceptable approach today? Sounds good. Let's go. All right. Let's dig into it. So let's, uh, so our, so there, our agenda is we'll cover a little bit about the CISO role, some of the threats and the challenges that as a CISO you're facing, Adrian, the market response to the evolving nature of attacks and exploits that are out there, where moving target defense gives you an added advantage against attackers, and where moving target defense really fits into your overall security model operationally. So with that, we'll kick off with question number one. So Adrian, what's the highest level priority that governs how you run security operations at LSEG? Are you focused on technology, people, processes, boardroom influence? So to, to be a modern CISO, we have to, of course, do, do all of those things. But I guess my top priority is always going to be getting the basics right, the sort of cyber hygiene, so to speak. So uh, no matter what sort of advanced stuff that um, I'm doing in terms of my business wants to go to the cloud or my business wants to embrace sort of new technologies, I need to make sure that throughout all of um, what they're doing, they're doing that securely. So I'm sort of looking at uh, ways in which that I can make sure that the patching on systems is, is up to date, the um, levels of defense I have for anti-malware, both file and fileless based attacks is up to date making sure that when I give users the ability to browse the internet, because you know, I'm here to enable, I'm not here to constrain, making sure when I do that, I do that in a, in a secure manner. All of these things I kind of lump in with the sort of so-called cyber hygiene, security basics, whatever you want to call it. So that will always be my, my top priority. It doesn't matter if I help secure what they're doing tomorrow if I haven't secured what we're operating today. So that's always my top priority. Sure thing. And, you know, one thing that we're seeing, or at least Gartner recently conducted a study um, and looked at some of the top concerns coming from CISOs. And I think what they're showing here is it's not necessarily just threats that CISOs are, are concerned with relative to the overall scope of what they're trying to do and the attacks that they're trying to prevent against and all the other constituencies that you're, that you're beholden to in an organization. 71% of CISOs said IT transformation is really their top concern. That's right. And, and businesses are adapting the way that they're, they're actually doing business, so their go-to-market strategy. So the CISOs need to adapt. But if, uh, if all you're doing is focusing on what you're transforming and not what you're operating today, some people call it legacy, you can call it the thing that makes you millions or billions of dollars, whichever way you want to call it, then you're going to have a problem. You're going to be breached and you won't be around tomorrow when all of that new ex exciting transformation. So I might disagree with Gartner's um, survey or at least the people that answered Gartner's survey and I say, you know, you've got to get the cyber hygiene right today. Otherwise, it won't be you in the job tomorrow when the transformation goes live. I, very, very interesting perspective. And, and ESG recently conducted a survey where they looked at some of the challenges that CISOs are facing, including too much time spent on manual processes, the team is, is understaffed for the size of the, uh, of, of the overall company, um, managers throughout the business don't really understand what security is doing, they're stuck with basic security controls that aren't necessarily handling the advanced threats. And certainly complexity, Adrian, would always be something that is, is always, it's always going to be a problem. It's always going to be challenging. What would you say about some of these top concerns? 
Yeah, I think that the the way in which security is evolving, I mean, certainly the uh, lack of talent that's available and even the talent that is available that's really focused on sort of infrastructure and sort of GRC and doesn't really understand applications or data or code, you know, that that's a real problem. So I certainly agree with the sort of understaffing in terms of it's very hard to find the right talent. Um, the manual process is one, yeah, I mean, that's going to be common across all businesses, not just uh, sort of information security departments. So I, I very much agree with that. Um, but the business management ones I, I vehemently disagree with. If you if you are not able to articulate and explain um, your your security posture or your risk position to people in a way that they can understand it and then they can give you support for it, then I, I think you're in the wrong job because that's the whole point of your job is to make sure that you are there to govern and oversee the amount of investment and controls that need to be put in place. And if you're saying, oh, I can't do that because people don't understand you know, why I want to spend that much money, then I don't think you're being as effective at your job as you need to be. So I think that's a, that's an interesting one. Businesses very much understand the concept of risk. It's just making sure that when you're working with them that you're understanding their imperatives and why is it that they're prioritizing something else rather than yours. You know, if you understand that, then you're very much a partner of the business rather than just you know, a tools provider or a service provider. And that sort of partnership, you know, seat at the table as people describe, is really where we all want to want to get to. Sure thing. And of course, you can't automate everything, right? <laughs> you can try, but yeah, you can't. <laughs> so, so this, so this is over to you. So, in terms of in terms of the criticality of your role to the business overall, I'll I'll turn this over to you, Adrian. Sure. So when I go um, into any any organization, I really sort of take stock of the current security posture and I sort of get, whether I use independent assessment or just my own review, you know, I get a real sort of check um, checkpoint for where we are today, a sort of line in the sand. Um, and then I produce a sort of security program of remediation and improvement and in, institutionalizing, whichever word that uh, your board of directors is most confident with. And that will sort of usually be a sort of two to three year plan. Um, so you've got to align that to what the business is um, doing. So if you come up and say, right, I need 100 million worth of investment, and they only spend 50 million a year on technology, you, you've, you've misjudged your audience. You're not going to get that level of expenditure. You've got to align it to the business value. So you've got to put, you know, the, the critical business so over here in the UK. We call them the crown jewels. You know, you've got to protect the crown jewels first. So you've got to make sure you understand what is of value to the business. You know, is it the, uh, the personal data of your customers? Is it the financial? Maybe you've got you know um, currency on your holding on behalf of, of your customers or your members. You know, these are the things you've got to understand because then you can put in place commensurate controls to the to the actual value of the asset that you're trying to protect. After all, if you're trying to spend you know five million dollars on a an asset that's only worth a million, then you, you've got that wrong. So really, I try and make sure that I, I come up with this program, I come up with this sort of um, plan, and then I communicate that, um, and including all of the metrics and milestones that we're going to be using. But when people are going to boards of directors or even senior sort of um, um, stakeholders within the business and trying to sort of explain security plans, often they talk about the wrong metrics. They take to them like, how many DDoS attacks have we had? Or how big was it? Um, you know the, these sort of metrics. So I've had a 10 gigabit, you know, um, DDoS attack, 100 gigabit, and kind of the business person, you know, looks at them and says that's nice, and you know, moves on to the next thing. Whereas if you go to them and say, right, I've had 10 minutes downtime of your critical business application due to DDoS, and this is what we're going to do about it, and how much we're going to spend to prevent that 10 minutes downtime in the future. That's a much better metric to talk to them about. They understand that. That's you know the value to the business. So you've got to measure the right things, and you've got to sort of align that to the business. Um, you mentioned here the sort of the, the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every 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 business has a cloud, whether it's public, private, hybrid. I personally don't like hybrids. Um, I actually don't think private clouds are, are all that good either, especially as uh, the amount of investment that the very large cloud providers can put in um, to security compared to what you can. So I, I would actually advocate a cloud-first strategy these days. Um, so things like you know email hosting and so on, just just outsource that. You know Google Docs, uh, Microsoft 365, just outsource that. You know it doesn't add any value to you um, internally, and they will host it much more securely than than you ever can because the amount of money they spend and the amount of resilience they have. Whereas things like your critical business applications, great, absolutely, you know host those internally, host those in your own private cloud, whichever you want to do, because that's the value to your business. Operating an email server really isn't value to your business. Sure thing. And then, of course, there's also the technical side of it, which is kind of the day-to-day, -day, 
and what you're kind of seeing that, that, that comes in. So tell us a little bit about, as a leader in the organization from a technical standpoint, how you, um, how you take this, uh, this type of strategy forward. Sure. I actually count myself as a technologist. I'm just a technologist that happens to specialize in information security or cybersecurity. Um, so you know, as a technologist, making sure I understand what the current trends are, what the business is trying to do so that I can sort of design a program that, that aligns to that. If I'm trying to have you know, manual code reviews done by my team of every single piece of software or every line of code that goes live, um, you know, I'm not going to be helping the business and I'm not really understanding the sort of modern development operations where, you know, whether you call it DevOps or whether you're using you know, Kanban, Sprints, whatever you want to call them, you know, where they're actually pushing to production several times a day. So you've really got to make sure that you design these patterns, you've got to design these um, approaches, uh, architectural templates, whatever you want to call them, such that you're enabling your business. So that if a developer wants to push to production 100 times a day, he can. Um, if she wants to you know, deploy in the middle of the night because there's been a, a bug and the, the color of the button needs to change from blue to red, or whatever it is, you know, he or she can do that. But if you're putting processes that are manual and sort of not giving automated training to your developers or not equipping them with the tools to do their jobs, then you're just getting in the way and people are going to try and circumvent you. And if people try to circumvent you, it's not them that screwed up. I mean, it'd be nice if everybody always followed the rules, but if your rules are draconian and horrible, then I think it's you that's got the problem. So yeah, right. start with those basics I mentioned right at the top, you know, the cyber hygiene, but really look at how can I enable the business. Um, that includes, you know, the business is going to be attacked. Everybody accepts that. You know, it's just the cost of doing business. If you're on the internet, you're going to be sort of targeted. And if you're not on the internet, then you're not a modern business. So how do you, you know, how do you protect against that? The unknown unknowns, as you, as you mentioned here, and that's really critical. Is like using a defense in depth strategy, making sure you've got enough controls to either protect what you can think of, or even postulate might actually happen. But also, how can you react? when the things that you didn't expect have, um, have to happen actually do happen. Because if you can actually put in place a flexible um, sort of architecture and system, including you know, running processes, whether it's red team, you know, drills, whatever you want to call them, um, exercises with your, your sort of people and processes to make sure it's not just your technical um, controls that are flexible, but your people as well, um, then you're going to be in a much better position. Whereas if the first time you're trying to run a process is that when an attack happens and there's a data leak or there's a threat to you know, some, some form of a system that you've got to deal with, that's the wrong time to be having those um, conversations for the first time. Very, very interesting. Very much appreciate that perspective too, Adrian. And uh, let's, let's move on to the, to the next question, which brings in the element of cyber threats. So obviously cyber threats to any business can come in, as you know, many, many forms. Attackers are using methodologies that are old. They're using new methodologies that are perhaps variants of, of, of older types of uh, old, older types of methods, um, and often are highly targeted. Some of the trends that you're yeah, seeing, the, right? Sure. I mean, some of the things I'm seeing are sort of uh, people much more um, commonly now using a multitude of attack vectors. So they might ring up a um, an assistant and try and find out the location of somebody and then they might send a, another message to another assistant of say the chief exec and say hey I know that so and so is at such and such conference or you know whatever information they've gathered here's a link to the video that you know he needs to review before um, before he goes on stage or you know the chairman of the board she's going to be presenting a I don't know, <laughs> you know, Davos, and you, uh, you, know, you send some link to that saying, wow, they, they came off really well, check out this. And that sort of contextual um, sort of information, much more likely to get a click through. I, I don't believe in all these sort of uh, anti-phishing sort of um, games that people sometimes play with their users where they try and you know, teach them how to detect a phishing email. You are always going to be able to get um, a user to click an email. And that's not a fault of the user. That's because you want them to be able to do their job, and they can't do their job if they can never click a link or never open a document. So you've got to be able to give them the controls to enable them to do that um, securely. So if you then get them through a link or a document that has you know, some form of malware embedded within it or a link that downloads it, um, we're seeing, I'm seeing a big increase in sort of um, fileless-based uh, in-memory attacks. In fact, you, you've got the stats up on the, on the screen. This is you know, a very much a growing trend of the mature, sophisticated, targeted attacks that I'm seeing and sort of hearing about in, in the industry. Um, and this is a problem because if you look at the classical defense uh, mechanisms that people have against some of these attacks, 
then they're failing. Then they're, they're not um, up to the job because they're very signature based, very static, very reactive. After the first place gets hacked, uh, a rule or a signature gets updated and all the other places won't get hacked. But that first place has been compromised. So we've got to do things differently and we've got to sort of step back and really understand what does defense in depth mean to an organization and how does our, uh, how does our architecture support that? And if you're not able to defend against some of those sort of more modern attacks, these sort of fireless attacks, um, targeting you know, endpoints, workstations, and sort of mobile devices as well, then I don't think you're doing a defense in depth strategy and I think you're going to be compromised. Sure thing, and you you covered uh, you covered that uh, highly effectively for me. So I appreciate that. I think what we're also still seeing is that when you're talking about boardroom visibility of security, Adrian, ransomware is still scaring people. ESG just put out um, just put out some data around ransomware, right? And the percentage of organizations where executive teams are concerned about it, and really shows that ransomware just I think because of the pure impact that some of the big ransomware attacks have had just really still scares people. And it still scares executives because, you know, perhaps the, it, you, know, you can attribute it to media hype. Perhaps you can also attribute it to the, the use cases of companies that really were, were, were brought to the ground by, by some of the big ransomware attacks of the past probably 18 months. What's your thought on, on ransomware out there? So I find it um, quite amusing when WannaCry hit um, because for the first time in the history, as far as I'm concerned, of uh, enterprise versus consumer. So if you imagine you know, two amorphous um, blobs on each side, um, enterprise has always been seen as, oh, much better at security. You know, they spend all this money, they do all this stuff. And then consumer on the other side that you know, just always get compromised and have all these issues. For the first time that I can think of in sort of security history, the consumers were better protected than enterprise. And the reason for that is because Microsoft, Google, Apple, you know, five years ago, sort of three to five years ago, I think it was, depending on which company, um, changed to automatic updates. So instead of the user having to do something, the, the machine just automatically downloads the latest updates and just reboots and, you know, just says, hey, I'm rebooting now. And if you say no, you know, it will give you a 24-hour grace period. So it will do it. So when WannaCry hit, um, you know, the patch, it hit in May, the patch to it came out in March by Microsoft. So all of these home consumers were already patched. So the companies that got um, infected by WannaCry, A, they had SMB exposed to the internet or somehow got you know, SMB um, accessible by a compromised computer, but they just hadn't patched their system since at least March and you know, probably given some of them a Windows XP uh, for several years. So that was really interesting to me, and it just showed that the world is changing. We can't keep doing things the way we've always done it and expecting a different result because we're not going to get it. You know, Einstein said that led to, um, to madness. So we've got to actually think about how do we change things. And I think the um, consumer sort of operating model now where you know, things patch every day is, is great. But enterprises can't do that. They can't. They want to do all these tests before they roll out and make sure all these legacy applications still work and so on. But enterprises have got to get to the point where they aren't just having to rely on static-based signatures to protect them because it's been proven now several times that it's not good enough. Sure thing. And so that brings in the, the challenges within the quote-unquote threat scape today that continues to, to expand. It seems like there's, it's only a matter of time before we hear about something that's going to be that next big methodology or that next methodology that's applied or, you know, some, some semblance of, a, of an evolution of a particular attack methodology that will ultimately find some back doors, that'll find some gaps in infrastructure, and that will, again, you know, start to target, to your point, some unsuspecting users. One, one thing I wanted you to, if you could, if you could hone in on here, you know, we're hearing a lot about, um, Adrian, supply chain attacks via third-party partners. Could you talk a little bit about sort of what your perspective is there um, and, and certainly what, uh, what organizations are, are doing or should be doing relative to, you know, even just vetting third-party partners? Sure. I mean, back in the day, we used to throw a big sort of perimeter, um, you know, around our around our castle. We we called it a moat. You know, that would be the sort of way we defend our castle against sort of um, rebels at, at the borders. Um, extend that to the sort of enterprise landscape. That was a very traditional way that, that we did it, sort of back in 2000, probably all the way through to 2005 or so. Um, so up until 2005. 
But now we don't have that border. We don't have that perimeter that we can defend on. There's you know, enemies within, there's enemies outside. You've got to make sure that you have uh, your little micro segments or borders, if you will, you know, around each of the things that you really care about. So those pieces of data that are critical, those assets that you're protecting, wh whatever it is, you've got to make sure you have A, understanding of where they are, and B, sort of appropriate controls to get to, to and from them. Um, supply chain just extends that. You know, the more we've obviously had some very big um, vulnerabilities, sorry, very big compromises happen through the supply chain. Some are public, I'm sure more are not. Um, that's just another um, sort of threat vector. And if, if you can't get into a house through the front door, then you go through the windows or you go through the back door. That's exactly the same with the supply chain. So that's a sort of similar analogy. So if you have a supply chain and that supply chain has, you know, privileged access to some of your environment or your systems or any form of access that is not considered sort of ordinary or slash web facing, then you've got to make sure you manage that. And the question is, how do you manage a you know a third party from from doing um, from you know what they're doing with their um, controls? And I don't think you can. So you've got to look at you know what what are they doing? Can you do behavioral analytics to see whether that's expected behavior? What controls are you using for the files that they send in or the access that they send in? Your endpoints, how are you protecting them from you know interacting with these? Um, services and not just supply chain, you know, just true SaaS services in the cloud as well. It all is part of a sort of modern threat landscape that you need to defend against. And third parties are being seen as uh, the weakest link at, link at the moment. So that and, as I mentioned earlier, assistance, um, I, I'm seeing a lot of traffic um, targeting them. Sure thing. And it's Apologies always, you know, your only assistance on the call. Exactly. So, and and of course, you know, you're only as you're only as strong from a security perspective as as your weak as your weakest link. So if organizations are targeting that, they're ahead they're ahead of the game at least, Adrian. If they can if they can actually identify that. Um, right, and if you if you know what the attackers are going to go after, I mean, you you've got all the um, it's all on your side. <laughs> you know where everything is. You know what the controls are. You can put in place extra controls. Yeah, all of this is you know, to your advantage. Use that. Make sure that you um, have an information asset register. Make sure you have a defense in depth strategy and multiple layers of con controls. There's no issue if uh, you know security tools these days all play nicely with each other. There's no problem having two tools. You know, one on perimeter and a different one on the endpoint. You know, they'll all play nicely. So you've got to make sure that you uh, you take that advantage that you've got and use it rather than you know, concede it to the enemy. Sure thing. So additional challenges within the organizational infrastructure. Talk to us a little bit about the 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 adaptation and the and the pace of business change where security isn't necessarily adapting to the way the business is evolving and moving forward with you know with some with some speed. Sure. I mean, as we people move much up to cloud native type environments um, rather than what I call cloud naive environments. So cloud native environments, you're sort of using modern platforms of service. There is no infrastructure. Infrastructure is going away. The only infrastructure we're going to have is for our endpoints. Um, so the you know, the services that we're running in the cloud, we're not having to patch the underlying operating system. We're just having to write good, secure code. Um, and that's great because the, all the weaknesses from sort of servers not being patched um, or ports being open that shouldn't be, all of that just goes away. And, and indeed, as I mentioned earlier, becomes managed by the, um, the cloud service provider. So as we move to the cloud, it changes how we have to design, build, and operate technology. And you've got to make sure that the people that you've got in your teams that are doing that understand how to design, build, and operate for the cloud and not just a sort of more traditional legacy or even trying to use a legacy approach in the cloud, like using IaaS in the cloud, I think is a, a recipe or an invitation to be hacked because if uh, modern organizations aren't able to identify and patch servers that they have in their own data centers, how are they going to do it when it's being spun up by a developer that they don't even know about? So I think they've got to sort of really embrace the cloud in a cloud native way and sort of um, ensure that they've got a, a appropriate controls for doing that. And that includes everything down to the computers that they're using to connect up to the cloud, all the way through to you know the the endpoints that the um, server the services are being consumed by. Sure thing. That, uh, excellent perspective, and uh, you know I think it's interesting as you're looking at the different. There, there almost seems to be too many options for where mm -hmm. you're going to you know where someone within IT or security could start to take that infrastructure. And I think one thing that is one thing that's certainly ringing true here is that 
it's really not just attacks. Um, Podemon released a, a stat very actually yesterday that said 83% of businesses think that the complexities of their organization and their infrastructure is putting them at greater risk for breach. Um, some of the considerations there, I think, would be, to, to your point that, that, that you just addressed, Adrian, certainly cloud, but certainly distributed environments, I think, can, can bring in uh, complexities, virtual desktop infrastructure, not just, not just physical machines and, and what might be the last of, you know, the real physical infrastructure, but, but virtual desktops as well, too. And then certainly, you know, the process of patching comes into play as well, too. So I think it, it all adds up to, look, it, it, as, a, as a CISO, it's not just attacks that you're, that you're concerned about. You've got a much more comprehensive sort of um, task ahead of you as, as you're looking at the overall organization and from a compute standpoint, what makes that organization go. Right. I mean, first of all, I didn't know that Pokemon did stats now, but uh, that's cool. But uh, I think the, uh, the for me, the, I call it ephemeral compute. You know, servers that get spun up and spun down, you know, within minutes, that so are very short lived. An IP address is completely fungible. It's not a way of identifying an endpoint because it you know, could change from hour to hour. This is the world in which we're sort of moving to with a cloud native environment. Now, there's benefits to that, it, like like I say, less patching involved and so on. But you have to be able to design, build, and operate applications and services that operate in that way, are horizontally scalable, are stateless. The, instead of having all this infrastructure like web application firewalls, physical firewalls, IDS, IPS, all these other sort of crappy infrastructure technologies, instead of having those protect the application, it's just the application that's going to be um, protecting itself or more modern sort of approaches to you know, API security are needed like in the cloud. And these, some of these new technologies are coming on board, but organizations need to understand how to embrace them. The other thing is, you know, when people look for tools, they often look to see, well, what's it replacing? It, these days, it's much more about defense in depth. It's an augmented strategy. It's not okay just to have you know, a single, um, a si a single um, layer when you, need to, when, when you can have two. Um, it's just it's just a different way of approaching things when you talk about you know the cloud um all the things you mentioned here you know virtual desktop environments when you have very large citrix and sort of vdi vdi estates you've got to ensure that the controls that you have on the endpoint aren't performance impacting because otherwise the um server teams are going to be just running servers just so that you can run you know legacy antivirus scans on them and that's just crazy it takes up cpu and a memory you've got to think about more modern approaches to things such as mo moving target defense which has such a low um, performance and memory impact that you know i, I was absolutely amazed the first time I saw it. Fantastic. So let's move on to question number three here, which essentially speaks, Adrian, to what you know what's out there. What are what are vendors doing? How's the market respond or in, responding rather to the evolving state of threats today, um, both over existing infrastructure and across you know sort of uh, to your point, the way the infrastructure is starting to change a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the, there's, some, there's also some data out there that suggests, okay, there's, you know, there, there's, all different, there's all different types of methods that you can apply. There's different approaches. But the reality is, from a detection standpoint out there, you know, quote, unquote, big defense is expensive. There's a lot of capital outlay. The cost of ownership rises dramatically, especially when teams are trying to do things themselves. The second thing is that, the residual risk is created from the unknown, unpatched vulnerabilities that are out there. And then, of course, as you refer to them, the unknown unknowns, right? And that creates a, a patch gap that really represents a substantial risk for any organization that's not watching that process carefully and doesn't have a strategic plan to address it effectively. That's right, but, but you can't take an organization as a whole. It, it's too big, it's too nebulous. You have to focus on the assets that you want to protect and then, in effect, work out rather than trying to start with the organization and work in, um, especially as you know, we mentioned supply chain and, and cloud. You know, where, where do the lines even get drawn these days? So I start with the assets that I care about and I work my way out. Now, one of the assets might be you know, an endpoint to protect. Uh, another might be a database with a set of um, personal, personally identifiable information or PHI, personal health information. Um, you know, I've got to start with those assets and work out. Now, 
all the way to the thing that actually consumes them, the services, I need to know what the security posture is. I need to know if it's code that I've written, that it's been through security scanning, um, you know, static code analysis. I need to know that the um, servers itself is patched. I need to know that the network, you know, has the appropriate level of controls for access. I need to know that the Wi-Fi, you know, has good strong authentication. Um, these days, I treat the internal corporate network and Wi-Fi pretty much as the internet anyway. But uh, you know, that's just my approach. Um, you just got to start from the center and, and work your way out. So then you say big defense is expensive. Well, okay. So here's the asset that I need to protect. Here's the value of that asset to the business. Here's the potential regulatory fines. Now let's make sure we have commensurate controls to that risk. It's all about risk management, and you need to understand the assets before you can understand whether you've got commensurate level of control in place. And if you haven't, then and the organisation, despite your you know, assurances that we will be hacked, it's just a question matter of time. If they still won't invest it in invest in fixing them, then you've got to either come up with another way of doing it more cheaply, or you've got to start finding somewhere else to work. Sure. There's also some research out there that suggests. There's and, and you mentioned you mentioned it earlier, Adrian. There are there are a lot of security controls out there which some consider as legacy, others consider as I can't rip these out or I can't I can't necessarily live without it because you know it's kind of baked into it's baked into my infrastructure at this point. Technologies like you know, network access controls and DLP and things like that. And we've seen a little bit of a shift over the past couple of years to what analysts and, and, and others and other influencers in the, or in the market are referring to as advanced detection and response. The notion of right. going and uh, ensuring that you're continuously monitoring for threats um, and that you're, you know, that often we, we, hear the, we hear the buzzword threat hunting. And ESG actually conducted a little bit of research and, and, and polled uh, a number of security execs and said, you know, if you had your choice, would you, would you want to prevent a, a higher volume a higher, and a higher percentage of advanced threats, or would you rather go and monitor so that you have to chase them, deal with incident response processes, investigate? You know, a lot of people refer to as chasing ghosts, Adrian, as opposed to wanting to actually prevent. And I think that the ultimate, the ultimate point that you want to get to as a security professional and certainly someone running a security team is, hey, you know, if I can, if I can increase the percentage of threats that are coming in to, that I can prevent against and then really go and kind of like focus and investigate on the ones that, you know, there's no silver lining and there's no silver bullet, but like there's a couple of things over here that I do need to go and investigate because I need to learn more about it. But boy, sure it would be great to be able to prevent against a much higher rate of, of threats. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I certainly see that there's a very traditional way of sort of defending, which is based on all the events that have happened in the past, we're going to make sure don't happen again. Um, and that's sort of, yeah, that's why we have airport scanners and things like that, that are looking for sort of um, bomb material in liquids and why we have such limited um, liquid allowances, because that was the threat that happened in the past. Therefore, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen in the future. Uh, I see the same thing in sort of cybersecurity, information security controls. We always seem to focus on what's happened in the past and making sure something like that doesn't happen again. And we don't focus on what could happen, uh, those unknown unknowns. And that's where I, that's, I think, is a problem. And that means that when those things that don't fit events that have happened in the past happen, then we're uninformed and we're un, unprepared or ill-prepared to actually defend against them. And technologies like moving target defense, which defend not just against the type of attacks we've seen in the past, but even potential attacks that we could see in the future that we haven't even dreamed of yet, the good guys or the bad guys, um, it, it can defend against them. And that's really interesting to me. It's a new type of technology, and that is a technology that uh, you know, really um, could make a difference as part of my overall defense in depth um, strategy which would bring in the evaluation of different types of security technology. I know you've said to me in the past, you have, as a CISO, I have to be in like continuous evaluation mode of innovation that's coming to, that's coming to market. And a number, of, right. a number of considerations there bring in the protection efficacy and then also operational uh, efficiency 
for things that I'm bringing in. I don't want a half-baked technology in, in my SOC that's, you know, that's not going to do what it says it's going to do. Right. And, and doing business, whether it's, you know, information security business or actually the business of your company, is all about managing technology. And that includes new technology, old technology or legacy. You, you, it's a complete cycle. And you've got to make sure that you're always able to evaluate new technology quickly, make a decision, even if it's discounted for now. It doesn't mean that you can't look at it again in the future. You've got to do that very quickly. There's such a lot of new technology that's coming out. You've got to be able to discern what's actually interesting to you right now and then spend your time on that. Whereas if all you're doing is, you know, spending time spinning up labs and spending months and months reviewing something before you make a decision not to do it, you're, you're just wasting a lot of time. So make those decisions quicker. I, I talk about failing forward faster. You know, it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. Just make them in small iterations and make sure you learn from them so that you move forward. Um, so I, we make those decisions, you know, we'll evaluate a new technology. You know, in week one, we'll make a decision. Do we like it or not? If we do, okay, fine. We'll give it a week two. If we don't, you know, throw it out. But no no problem trying it again in six months' time. Maybe the next version of the product comes out. So, yeah, I, I very much agree that you need to you know, get good at doing that, get good at sort of evaluating technology, integrating technology, and understanding your environment so that you know exactly where it could fit, even without you know, double-clicking setup for the very first time. Sure thing. And when you're talking about operational efficiency, you're looking at a couple of key things that – kind of line up in your in your criteria list things like ease of use impact on system performance um, false positives obviously everybody in, in cyber you know all vendors in cyber talk about that um, and then certainly the mediation requirements what what do you prioritize from an operational standpoint yeah, I mean, uh, the most secure piece of data in the world is data, you know, I put on a hard disk that's encrypted, I put that hard disk in a safe, and I put that safe at the bottom of the ocean. It's pretty secure. It's as close as I could come without, you know, destroying it. But that's really useless to the business. So with all of the security controls, you have to understand what is the impact that you're asking the business to go through, whether that's a performance impact, and therefore you have to spend more money on CPUs, whether that's a productivity impact, like I'm asking people to stand on one leg, hold their phone up and you know smile at a camera at the same time. You know, whatever it is, I've got to understand what that impact is. And with that I then need I can go to the business and say, hey, this is this is what I the decision I've come to and this is why. And in partnership, you know, we agree or, or disagree on whether that's the right approach for that, you know, solving that risk. So all of these controls that try and run on the endpoint do advanced AI or UBA or all these, you know, analytic stuff, whether or not they're cloud augmented. I, I just don't have time for them because they're they're not very effective. They're high performance impact, and they're not really solving the problem that I need them to solve. And that's why I, I go for more technologies like moving target defense. So let's move on and dig in a little bit more into moving target defense. So in in your eyes, how revolutionary is moving target defense from a cyber protection standpoint in terms of where that fits versus anything else that you've seen in the market? So for me, moving target defense has actually delivered on the promise of what AI um, on the endpoint was uh, was <laughs> has been saying for years it was actually going to do. So trying to protect against future attacks that we don't know about today and prevent them rather than just detecting that it's happened and then trying to stop it afterwards, you know, that that is revolutionary for me. I think it's... Uh, there's been a lot of evolutions in the past with sort of static um, analysis, you know, static signature based on protection. But really, when moving target defense sort of technology was dreamed up and implemented in an effective way, I think that's been revolutionary. And I haven't seen any other technology that has as low performance impact, you know, 0% at, at runtime, uh, very, very low memory um, footprint. Um, compared to you know, all these other things, I've agent bloatware I've had to put on the endpoint, which just every time they're like, oh, it only takes two or three percent CPU, or oh, it only takes another you know, gig of memory. <laughs> so it, I really was I was amazed the first time I saw it, and then the fact that it keeps defending against attacks that, as I say, hadn't even been um, thought of or created when the uh, when that say version of the, the software moving target defense was actually rolled out. Uh, is just unprecedented. I can't think of other stuff that's done that um, in the same way, with as low, certainly not with as low performance impact. Sure thing. And what, one thing that you hit on earlier was tools have changed. And one thing that, that we always talk to customers about is 
not just necessarily about moving target defense, but we understand that there's a there's an operational component of simplicity that has to make its way into into security technology that's coming to market now. It can't just it can't just be the same old stuff that takes forever and you know months to deploy and integrate with everything else. And then you, you sort of see the axis here of operational simplicity and protection from from advanced threats. Moving target defense is a little right. different, and it's sort of that next evolution of, you know, where, where we where we started years ago with antivirus, which was purely reactive. We're moving toward more of a, a proactive prevention movement with with something like moving target defense, and I think that for us, that that's what we talk to customers about. Um, would you would you agree with the fact that we're move, it, this this helps take a security team from a reactive stance? A much more of a proactive thing. Yeah, absolutely. And like I say, to protect against uh, threats that haven't even been dreamed of yet, that, that's just unprecedented. And it's almost like the way in which we evaluate these technologies needs to change because you know, false positive rate and um, performance, you know, you, you'll just be at the top of every single chart. So we need a new way of actually measuring some of these um, new threats that we're seeing um, and therefore the technologies that are protecting against it because I don't think some of the current ways we have of measuring them are, are truly showing the simplistic beauty that is uh, moving target defense. And when you're thinking about preventing threats, we talked a little bit already about efficacy. We talked about operational efficiency from, from just at a high level, Adrian. But two things that we always hear from customers are time and then different vectors of attack, attacks that come in through different means, at least into, at least into the infrastructure via the endpoint. And one thing that I'd love for you to hit on is thinking about the impact of time in terms of being able to detect something at time zero and then be able to prevent against something like lateral movement. We hear about lateral movement all the time, but could you just give us 30 seconds on where you really feel like what, like why lateral movement for an attacker is something that you just can't ever allow in your infrastructure? Well, I mean, once they have a foothold, from that point on, you know, it's pretty much game over because if they can actually get a entry point into your environment, they're going to find something. They're going to find a server that isn't patched. They're going to find another workstation that's, you know, not as well protected as the, the first workstation they're on. And they can do privilege escalation, pass the hash, you know, all these other different techniques um, for sort of lateral movement. Uh, are just There's so many of them. So you've got to make sure that you're controlling sort of the access that the, the, the bad guys uh, could actually potentially get. And if you if they can't even get that foothold, then A, you're going to save money because your forensics is a lot lower. Even if one machine gets compromised, you know, if they're contained to that machine, it's, it's a lot cheaper. Um, but B, just the incident is going to be much more limited in scope. So yeah, l lateral movement, you know, anything you can do to prevent them getting there in the first place is, is obviously the way to go. And finally, we've made it to our to our last question here. Um, relative to moving target defense, can you give us a little more color on how it helps you, Adrian, from an operational standpoint? Kind of almost looking at this in in almost with a with a dividing line in between the two areas. One which is protection, the other which is operationally. Where does this la when where does moving target defense lend itself to to more efficiencies for you and what you're trying to do to protect your organization? So I mean the from an IT perspective, the efficiencies are yeah, what's the performance impact? How complicated is it to manage? What's my total cost of ownership going to be? So you've got to make sure you tick all those boxes. And as I mentioned before, moving target defense, CPU impact is so low that it's uh, you know, practically zero runtime. That it, 
they can even measure it. Um, then it's the question of you know how easy is it to install, how easy is it to monitor and manage, and again, very, very effective. Those are all the things that would determine whether or not I can use a control, even if the control was amazingly effective or not. If it was 100% CPU, if it was, I'm going to extremes, obviously, you're really hard to manage, then I, I couldn't even consider it. So it just ticks all of those boxes straight away, which is really good. And whether I'm a virtual um, desktop environment or whether I'm a you know a sort of thick desktop, you know, full workstation, laptop, whatever, um, it, it absolutely has zero performance impact at, at runtime, and that's amazing. Then you come to the security aspects of it, which is what are the false positives like? How is it actually blocking what it says it's going to be blocking? And with Morphisec, you know, I had various evaluations done, and I was amazed. I was really amazed. It, it sort of all the tests I, I was able to throw at it, it was able to defend against, and even some that we didn't think it would, it was able to protect against. So that's why you know I, I do webinars like this because I'm I, I love the technology. I think it's very revolutionary, and I think more people using it will actually better protect all these organizations. So we've got a couple of questions that are coming in. We have literally, I think, maybe two more. We've got two more pieces of information to present here, Adrian. So I've got, so uh, we'll, we'll wait until uh, just for the audience's benefit. We see a couple of the questions coming in. We will answer them in probably about two minutes if you can, if you can hang on. Last point about operational, operational impact. Simplicity versus cost. Give us, give us 30 seconds on the element of simplicity, right, and and the and it, with moving target defense, at least in in your eyes, you know, the absence of of having to pamper or babysit a technology that's throwing all kinds of you know white noise types of alerts at you, versus the the cost of you know acquiring the tech, deployment and integration. Sure. I mean, if I have to deploy, let's say, an agent to my workstation, but then I have to deploy signature updates to, or that it goes and gets the updates from the cloud, you know, at a routine basis, there's a period of time um, in between where I'm exposed. If you compare that to Morphisec, where once the product's on there and the moving target defense protections are in place, I don't have to update it. Like if a Microsoft patch comes up, um, I can go, okay, we'll just, you know, we'll, a critical patch, we'll just patch that, you know, if it's targeting sort of you know, memory-based attack, I'll, I'll just wait until the next monthly, you know, update or patch cycle. So WannaCry, you know, WannaCry hits, you go, oh, okay, well, hopefully you'd already patched from March anyway. You go, oh, it's okay, you know, Morphisec will be able to protect against that. I can not cost the business the impact of having to roll out an emergency patch overnight. You've got to measure that in, you know, business um, dollars, and, and that is is very, uh, for me, that made a lot of savings, uh, the ability to be able to do that. So ignoring the, the fact you don't get hacked in the first place, which saves a lot of money, the ability to not have to patch immediately or not have to have all my agents you know, download signature updates every hour, every minute, you know, that, that is actually a benefit. That's what I call the kind of total cost of ownership. And as you've got here on, on this sort of uh, the two sides here, uh, I, I totally agree. You know, being able to um, fire and forget, be able to deploy it um, and just leave it is great. It sits very well on my endpoints. Um, one of the questions was, you know, what other technologies do I run on my endpoints? I do still run antivirus. I still run, um, you know, signature-based antivirus. There is a place for it to play but it doesn't cover everything. The kind of advanced malware type of solutions that some of the antivirus um, vendors are now providing, they just don't um, compare when I run them up against Morphisec. So I run an antivirus as a sort of base on my endpoint, and then I run um, Morphisec on top of it. And in terms of thinking about critical layers, right, this is one of the, this is one of the, the concepts that, that you like to address uh, fairly frequently, which is, Looking, looking at your security from a defense in depth standpoint, but looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, I don't need every single piece of security telemetry to actually be effective today, not only just against the threats that are specific to my business, but also to how I'm, how I'm managing my overall approach to security relative to security kind of fitting into the business. What are your thoughts on, on sort of this? You've already addressed defense in depth, so I don't want to beat that to death. But in terms of looking at the four different layers as you see them, how would you how would you recommend uh, this type of strategy to uh, to the attendees today? 
Yeah, I mean, for, for each organization, you've got to understand, you know, what is it you're trying to protect? And then what are the levels of, uh, what's, what's your um, threat surface that people could attack through? And the problem is that memory-based um, fileless type attacks are increasing and the efficacy of the um, controls today is not high. And that's obviously why the attacks are increasing because they're seeing that there's a vulnerability there that isn't being well well protected against. So defense in depth, you know, it's not okay just to have a email scanner or you know web scanner and then sort of basic antivirus. I, I believe you need to go beyond that. You have to be able to protect against fileless level attacks um, that are being, even files that are being reconstructed, you know, in Word using macro technology, and which then results in an exe, you know, some of these sort of very modern attacks, you've got to be able to have a defense against. And just basic AV just doesn't cut it. Identity and access management is all about, you know, who is it that's doing something and, and, and why. Um, and then, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we put this big moat around organizations. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm not saying give up the perimeter. I'm just saying don't rely on it solely. So you do need to have a perimeter. I talk about micro segmentation or a micro perimeter around whatever the asset you control about. But the perimeter isn't just a firewall. The perimeter it can be identity. It can be encryption. You know, all these other different controls we can use. Um, it's not just, oh, this port is allowed to talk to this port on you know, these computers. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of my take on, on defense and that. Excellent. And we've come to our last slide. And this is often what we, what we talk to customers about. And this is what customers actually ask us, which is, how can you lower my risk, drive that down across all of the security spend that I have on my, on my budget, right? So I break out my spreadsheet in terms of what I'm spending on all of the different pieces of security technology in my SOC, you know, stemming from something like DNS all the way up to, and the often very expensive EDR technology. Um, one thing that we like to talk to customers about, Adrian, and obviously I think you probably support this, is we're driving down that risk and we're actually, with moving target defense, as part of your overall strategy and as a te critical technology in your security operations center, we're actually giving you more value for some of the stuff that you've already got deployed there. Certainly, like EDR, you know, you can if you if your if your EDR agents are are firing on all types of different you know anomalies that that may or may not be something. You're using a lot of CPU. You're using a lot of manpower, especially with an EDR stack, to go and chase threats, right? And to go and investigate threats that probably eight out of 10 aren't going to amount to much and aren't going to be targeted types of attacks. What's your, what's right. your final so thought we, on driving down the risk? Yeah, I mean, if you can ensure that the quality of the alerts that you are getting from your endpoints are, are you know, genuine alerts that need investigation, yeah, that saves a lot of time. But more importantly, it prioritizes what is actually going to be something that's worth spending the time on. Um, and in an incident, everybody knows, you know, time is time is your enemy. You've got to get to the point where you know what's happened as quickly as possible. And if you've got data sources you can rely on from very sort of good technologies like moving target defense, where, you know, if it says it's uh, it was malware or, and it's you know prevented it, then, you know, believe it and go and do the investigation. Sure. Well, th thank you very much for that perspective. We do have a few more questions that have come in here, Adrian. One, which is, what is your take on, on outsourcing security? So probably, I guess, geared toward taking different types of technologies, outsourcing them to uh, a trusted provider, um, perhaps in an MSSB model. Sure. So my, my approach to technology, not just security, is to outsource anything that doesn't differentiate you. So I mentioned earlier, you know, email hosting. Just give it to Microsoft 0365. Just let them do it, honestly. Um, I can't host that internally to my organization even close to as securely as, as they can. And I take the same approach within um, security operations. Like, let's say, the SIEM. I don't need to operate that internally. You know, it's not got any personally identifiable data information, certainly no PHI information. It would be okay to put that into a cloud provider and have them provide that, not really as an MSSP, I don't like that term, but yeah, as a sort of security service to me. So choosing your partners wisely, absolutely. Because if I've got 
you know, security um, analysts, you know, and I'm having to hire them myself. Um, and I've got to try and make them work 24-7 and cover, you know, around the sun, all, all the rest of it. That's just stuff that's distracting me from actually protecting the organization. It needs to be done. It's really important that it can be done. But either automate it or outsource it, absolutely, all the time. And then focus on what really matters. And, you know, the endpoint, making sure that's secure, the application code, going to the cloud. Those are the things that will differentiate you. Um, installing servers and SANs and disks so that you can run a you know, Hadoop cluster and operate a seam yourself, I, I just don't think that differentiates you. Um, it doesn't, certainly doesn't benefit the business. So don't do it. Sure, it's, good. it's great advice too, uh, because obviously you're, you're, when you start to build out clusters through a, uh, through a, through a stack like that, you're, you're talking about a lot of costs and you're talking about a lot of management and time spent managing, to your point, Adrian, the things that don't necessarily matter and the things that aren't going to map to exactly what you are trying to do as your role in, in, in security. One thing, um, That's right. one thing here, uh, a, a part of another question here that, that just came in, we just had a, uh, we just had a couple of, a couple more questions actually come in, Adrian. So, uh, one thing, uh, one question was, what are you, what else are you running, which you already answered, but, um, you want to maybe give uh, 30 seconds on, on how you actually evaluated Morphosec? You said you threw a number of attacks at Morphosec um, and the, the moving target defense yeah, so approach we, we took, was able to capture it. Sure. So we took our sort of standard desktop image. We gave it to a um, third-party penetration testing sort of lab setup um, and had them throw a ton of malware at it. So instead of having that on my network and trying to put all sorts of uh, active or malicious, you know, live uh, malware on my network, I decided to do that off-premise. Um, and by sending all that sort of traffic, uh, sorry, all that traffic at that um, image, they were able to prove whether or not they could um, get through the um, uh, get through the sort of moving target defense Morphosec product. Um, we did it both with and without AV enabled, and because we had a couple of different AV products, um, we tested it with against uh, you know compatibility with multiple AV products, and there was no problem at all with in interoperability. Um, and I'm at my second place now where I've evaluated and used Morphisec, so um, I guess I'm a little bit of a long-time customer when it comes to uh, to Morphisec. Thank you. Um, looks like uh, we've got another question that that has come in here. Uh, it says. You mentioned a few times about proactive security and finding weaknesses before they actually happen. Moving target defense is one of the best ways of doing so. Do you think that the breach attack simulation products are a good way of finding out your holes uh, with a hacking head on and making what you have actually purchased already better and probably function better? Sure. So you've got to be able to, in effect, prove the value that you've provided to the business. So if, you've, if you're going to do that with some of these simulation products, fine. I mean, to me, you've got to get um, confidence in what it is you've deployed. And if that gives you that confidence, then that's the fine way of doing it. Um, I want to run red team exercises. I want to run sort of uh, attack simulations, war gaming, whatever you want to call them. And those can be both technical and they can be um, sort of you know just tabletop exercises. Um, all are important. As like I said uh, very early on in the webinar, the if the first time you're making a decision on you know do you have to pay ransomware is the time when you actually have ransomware, then that's too late. Um, some of these new technologies that do ongoing monitoring, my only issue with that is, sorry, ongoing attacks, is um, how do you differentiate between a, you know, what's a, a known and expected attack and what, uh, um, what else is out there. But yes, you, you, you need to know that your seam is effective, you need to know that your endpoint defense is, defect is effective, and all of these controls, um, test them however you, you want to, but uh, um, I personally don't use that technology, those um, sort of attack simulation products. Um, but I do use uh, penetration testing services, and I do use uh, um, tabletop um, exercises. Adrian, thank you very much today. Uh, I certainly have enjoyed the conversation, um, and I think I, you know, every time every time we talk, it's a great conversation because I learn more than you probably think you're teaching me. So <laughs> I personally thank you, and certainly for our <laughs> attendees today, I'm sure they I'm sure they are very thankful to hear your perspective on not necessarily just moving target defense, but also sort of, you know, an effective strategy and approach for, for cybersecurity today overall. And I think it's really helpful. Um, and, you know, I certainly think that we need more CISOs to be able to 
share their knowledge and their experience and their use cases with with a, a, a larger audience. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Adrian. Um, and just for the audience, that will conclude the webinar today. Feel free to uh, to give us a rating. We certainly are always interested in, in feedback, and we certainly hope that this is helpful for you today. So, again, thank you very much on behalf of, uh, of Morphstech and Adrian. Thanks so much.